when the United States government began building Rocky Flats, America was in the middle of the coldest years of the Cold War. It's the old, if I got a bigger stick than you got, then you're probably not gonna hit me. It was a very dangerous game they were playing, but still, that's where we were. This was the age of McCarthyism, duck and cover. Civil defense measures were intended to make people feel like they could survive a nuclear attack. Rocky Flats produced more than 70,000 plutonium pits or triggers for nuclear weapons. A piece of every bomb that's in our nuclear arsenal has something to do with Rocky Flats. A lot of people feared that annihilation beckoned. Colorado Experience is made in partnership with History Colorado. Inspiring generations to find wonder and meaning in our past and to engage in creating a better Colorado. HistoryColorado.org With funding provided by the University of Denver, celebrating 150 years. The Denver Public Library. The Colorado Office of Film, Television, and Media. With additional funding and support from these fine organizations and viewers like you. Thank you. The Cold War was a period immediately after the end of the Second World War when the United States and the Soviet Union were left standing as the two remaining superpowers. Although they had been allies against Germany in the Second World War, their ideologies clashed with each other in ways that many experts were worried would turn into a global conflict. It was a war of words, a lot of proxy wars, the threat of nuclear annihilation of each country the concept of mutually assured destruction. The atomic weapons that were created served as a deterrent. If the Soviet Union knew that we had atomic missiles pointed at them, the theory went that they would be less likely to send their missiles to us. Even before the Second World War, Colorado boosters had been aggressively pushing for the creation of military installations. In a lot of ways, the West was gaining a lot of financial assistance from the government to start building up military installations. Colorado definitely wanted in on all this. We're talking millions of dollars. In addition to a number of military bases, the United States government subsidized the creation of the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, which was really opened in 1942 to create chemical weapons as a deterrent against Nazi Germany but which found a new life during the Cold War. And NORAD, which became America's surveillance headquarters for a potential nuclear war with the Soviet Union. And then Rocky Flats, that made plutonium triggers for atomic weapons. The Atomic Energy Commission started scouting out places. There were 21 sites on the list. And Rocky Flats was deemed the perfect spot, largely because it has some natural protection, low humidity, low vulnerability to dust, access to railroads, as well as water sources. And it wasn't that far away from Western Slope uranium deposits, which were used as the base for the plutonium triggers. The Atomic Energy Commission planned to spend $45 million constructing the plant. It would employ thousands of workers. It would bring millions of dollars into the Colorado economy. And so the early news reports said, look, we don't know what's going on here, but it's probably good news for Colorado. The plant opened in 1952. Rocky Flats was meant to convert the plutonium, which they got from other sites, which was liquid at that point in time, into a metal to create the pits or the triggers that will then be sent down to Pantex down in Texas, where they're gonna be installed in the bombs themselves. The interesting thing is that you're not gonna find a factory that's going to build a bomb from start to finish. Remember, this is a time when communist threat is a big thing, and there is a big fear about communist subversion. And so there was a concern that a lot of the people who were involved academically could possibly be communist. So ultimately, the big concern is to try to separate the process out so no one person knows it from start to finish. Rocky Flats was a machine shop. We machined plutonium, uranium, beryllium, pretty much any metal that needed to be machined into a part that somebody else couldn't do. Outside of the government, nobody knew beyond the fact that it had something to do with our national defense what exactly was going on inside Rocky Flats. Most Coloradans accepted that as simply one of the facts of the new secrecy required to fight the Soviet Union. When I went out there the first time, the sign on the west side says, 
nuclear facility, you kind of figure that it's got to have something to do with <laughs> nuclear, either weapons or reactors, and I knew there wasn't any reactors. We didn't talk about the, what we did at Rocky to the family. We didn't talk about it in the carpools. You just didn't talk. The rumor in our neighborhood was that they were making household cleaning supplies. My mother for years thought that they were making scrubbing bubbles. During the Cold War, nuclear weapons plants were allowed to operate in complete secrecy because of the Atomic Energy Act. They were under no obligation to tell people what was going on in terms of what was being produced and also what was going on with respect to radioactive and toxic contaminants on site and off site. It was sort of an Alice in Wonderland experience, surrounded by all this equipment and some things you understood and some things you didn't. You can get a nuclear engineering degree in school, but they'll never cover the stuff that these guys were experts in. So they more or less were hiring people off the streets. A lot of our people tell us that they were just farmers, and they went in there with their high school education, and they learned on the job how to process plutonium. And these people got very smart while they were out there. It was a city within a city. We had the same services as all your counties and cities have. The city was family to me. We did bowling, tennis, golf. We had baseball teams, soccer teams, picnics all the time, and I like to remember it that way. When it was announced in the Denver papers that the Atomic Energy Commission was going to be building a plant in Denver, Colorado was very excited. There was a lot of growth going on. It kicked off a housing boom. Lots of people welcomed it with open arms. There was 8,700 people out there at one time at the site and 2,200 construction workers. Our Vada wouldn't be what it is today, in my mind, if it weren't for Rocky Flats, because a lot of people wanted to live close to the plant site so they didn't have a long drive. Word got out only slowly about what exactly was going on inside of Rocky Flats. Uh, high officials in the Atomic Energy Commission made misstatements that let people know that parts of weapons were being produced there. Rocky Flats produced 70,000 plutonium triggers. The half-life of plutonium-239 is 24,000 years and, and change, and only degrades after 250,000 years. That's the primary plutonium at Rocky Flats. It's a man-made isotope. It's a highly radioactive metal that's carcinogenic. It's teratogenic. It causes aberrations in the chromosomes. It was very pyrophoric, very pyrophoric. An extremely volatile material. Now, people didn't understand clearly the link between cancer and plutonium, but studies in the 1960s, the early 1970s, and by, certainly by the 1980s, made a stronger and stronger connection. We would actually take some of the plutonium and hand finish it inside glove boxes, generally speaking. It would be formed, shaped, size exact that was needed, and then a part would go into a final weapon. There wasn't any machining or precise machining until 1957. These glove boxes were linked, and the plutonium was moved down a conveyor belt. A lot of the early ones had plexiglass, but basically you couldn't directly handle the plutonium, and the plutonium were put into these contained boxes, and you had these specific gloves that you had to wear, and the dexterity on these workers had to be incredible because the gloves are heavy, they're leaded, they're really hard to work with. It's also set up so that it has an inflow into the glove box and through the glove box, and an exit filtering system before it goes to the plenum so that it can contain the alpha contamination. If you punctured a glove or had a leak in a tank or a leak on a valve, you can inhale it. And if you do that, then it could affect your lungs. You get it on your skin, then you have to be decontaminated. And that wasn't a pleasant issue because if you got a lot of it on you, you usually wound up in medical being decontaminated using Clorox and a brush, <laughs> and it didn't leave a lot of skin when they got done. <laughs> Those were issues that, that you dealt with and, and you recognized the, the risk and you did everything you could to prevent those things from happening. The first big fire happened in 1957. It barely registered any blips on the record. There was a mention in some of the newspapers, but ultimately not a lot of concern on the part of citizens. There was a spark in a glove box. That fire raced through the glove box line. It burned out the building itself and the glove boxes, but it burned out filters and it burned out all of the measuring equipment. So we will never know exactly how much radioactive and toxic contamination was spread over the Metro Denver area. 
On Mother's Day in 1969, May 11th, a piece of scrap plutonium spontaneously combusted. Think of it as a, a charcoal briquette of plutonium that is smoldering, igniting all of the material around it. It raced through the line, came within seconds of a criticality. They went in and they found that their fire suppression equipment was inadequate. And they'd been instructed specifically not to pour water on a plutonium fire because it could trigger a chain reaction and an atomic detonation. But desperate to put out the fire at any cost, they used water anyway and they got it out. This fire caused enough damage that actually got on the radar. America at this point is really shifting its consciousness about health and environmental issues. People were inspired to try to take action, be concerned about pollution, so they really small-scale environmental movement that's going to boom very quickly. Beginning in the early 1970s, there were protests out at Rocky Flats. Some of those early protests were anti-war protesters and people interested in, in peace. They weren't fully aware of what was going on at the plant, but they knew it had something to do with the Cold War effort. Also by the 1980s, Americans were becoming more convinced that an atomic exchange with the Soviet Union really serves nobody's interests at all. And because of the increased evidence of health risks, because of the anti-war movement and the anti-atomic weapon movement, Coloradans began protesting in more visible ways against Rocky Flats. In 1983, there was an encirclement of the plant. It's a big site, almost 17 miles all the way around. People came and linked hands around the plant in a real moment of solidarity. And it's definitely one of the most enduring images of the Rocky Flats plant. It was kind of a curiosity. We knew we had a mission. We were helping keep America safe. And we saw young people out at the gate. They were idealistic. They didn't like war. You know, I could identify with what they were out there for, but yet I kind of figured they didn't really understand that we were doing something very important too and something very necessary. In the 50s and 60s, when you operated a facility like this, if you went to a health department and said, what do I do with this, they'd say, dig a hole put it in a hole. It was assumed that the soil column took care of that. What we found out after years of discovering the stuff actually migrated out was, no, the soil column doesn't take care of that. The basic idea is that if you bury it, it's not exposed to the air, therefore there's really no harm, no foul. I worked with every radioactive material that we had at Rocky Flats. Not only plutonium, not only uranium, but curium, uh, neptunium, uh, uranium-233, a lot of other materials as well. Trichlor, perchlor, HCl. The plant was like a huge chemistry set. When we were shutting down, I had a group of people working for me that were identifying containers of chemicals. They identified 5,700 containers. Now that's all the way from a four gram vial to a 4,500 pound cylinder of HF. 37 pages worth of chemicals. All of us were exposed to some degree, but basically we all stayed within the limits. Some of us did receive a little more plutonium, primarily from the early days. We started out with respirators that were just one pad. We went and did work all over with that one pad. We then later went with the better pad, later went with supplied air and other ways of protecting the workers. I was trained on how to deal with these materials, also was given personal protective equipment, although when you get to the bottom end of it, from a radiation standpoint, you don't always get protected from everything that you're dealing with. And I ultimately wound up in the top 10 of the most exposed people at Rocky Flats. I have not had any health issues from working at Rocky Flats. I worked with a lot of people that had health problems. It was a very dangerous game they were playing in the Cold War, but still, that's where we were. Someone had to do the job. People will ask you, if you knew that place was so dangerous, why didn't you just walk off the job? You get in there and you do your part. They assured you you'd be safe. If you stayed in there a short amount of time, you wore this gear and you worked properly, you trusted them. And if you followed the rules, you're gonna be okay. And we trusted each other. If there was a guy in there measuring the radiation, there was somebody else who set the standards for radiation and said, this much exposure is safe and this much is not. You trusted and you knew what he was doing. I worked there forever. Most of the members in my family worked there. I've lost uh, a big part of my right lung, my left lung from cancer, primarily asbestos, not just plutonium. Oh yeah, I had kidney cancer and I had cervical cancer. Seven surgeries on my left eye, six on the right. I've got pneumoconiosis and I've got neuropathy. 
The illnesses? Yeah, I've got illnesses. The latency period I've heard is 30 years to 40 years. So I don't know when it's going to stop, if, if it ever stops. Right now, my, my main illness seems to be asthma. But I, I do have nodules in my lungs. And nodules in your lungs can mean uh, lung cancer. There were some workers that received over the amount of the, uh, radiation that they maybe should have. And you're talking minute amounts of plutonium getting exposed to the air, but even small amounts can cause a lot of damage biologically. So a lot of workers starting to blow the whistle on their own health effects, but there's also a major concern about a lack of concern on the part of the owners and the government about safety regulations. And a lot of studies that were being done in the area led up to that FBI raid. There was an incinerator out at Rocky Flats, and that incinerator burned plutonium-contaminated waste for decades. In December of 88, there was a flyover, and infrared pictures were taken of the building. The infrared overflight was conducted at night. By this time, there was an, a DOE-ordered shutdown of Building 771. The DOE orders for safeguards and security required that we would do a inventory twice a year and those inventory times were set up for December and June. But I wanted to fly over and see what the incinerator stack looked like, what the building looked like, as well as other buildings. The solar evaporation ponds were supposed to be closed. I wanted to see what the heat signatures looked like. During that inventory period, we would also clean the glove boxes from top to bottom. And the way we did that was we used steam, which runs about 300 plus degrees. So all this heat that's being generated is going out through the exhaust and eventually out the stack. And when they flew over and took the picture, they thought we were running the incinerator illegally. Those flyovers led to a raid on June 6, 1989. FBI agents showed up basically unannounced at the plant. Under the guise, a ruse, that we were gonna have a high-level briefing. That's how we got into the gate. It's the only time in the history of our country that two government agencies have raided another. I had just walked out into the hallway, and um, down the hallway came a crew of people that just busted through the airlock door and they were heading down the hallway. We took over a conference room and some other side rooms. We had an evidence control crew. Everything we took was photocopied. I believe it was over a million pages. It was over 600 environmental samples. We were out there 18 days. They were also very concerned about the evaporation ponds. They were concerned about what was called pondcrete, an effort to stabilize plutonium. The problem with the pondcrete was that it never set. It was like plutonium jelly. That raid led to a two-year grand jury investigation. The grand jurors wanted to indict five Rockwell officials and three Department of Energy officials, and they wanted Rockwell and Dow to admit that they had misrepresented the facts to the public, and also admit that there had been contamination and there was ongoing contamination. The end result was that Rockwell International pled guilty to 10 environmental crimes and agreed to a fine of $18 million. The main thing that the jurors wanted people to know was not just that there had been uh, contamination in the past, but that contamination was ongoing. And that people in the surrounding areas in the Metro Denver area needed to know that. They decided to write their own grand jury report. That report was sealed by the judge and remains sealed to the present day. We are back in operation in 1990. Rockwell got replaced by EG&G as a contractor we went into an operational readiness review and we were going to rewrite all the procedures, redo equipment that needed to be upgraded and new safety measures put in place. And that's where we were at into 92 when it was finally decided out of Washington that Rocky Flats was no longer needed. I honestly believe the main reason Rocky Flats closed was not because of the FBI raid or the things they found. It was because the Cold War ended and we didn't have the need for the nuclear weapons that we previously had. In other words, we were out of a mission. Once there was no need to produce a continuous supply of components for the weapons program, Rocky Flats was out of business. 
the entire property was turned over to the environmental management portion of the Department of Energy for final remediation and demolition and closure. Once the buildings were decontaminated, decommissioned, then they went into a stage that we called cold and dark. At that point, we could start tearing down the buildings. All of the contamination on the surface was removed for $7 billion. In turn, they also went down four to six feet below the surface. Deeper than that, what they basically did is cleaned up any of the concrete or anything that was under there to where there was reading almost nil contamination. They put it on these huge trucks to be buried in places like New Mexico, away from populations. There's not really a great way of saying, what do we do with all this stuff? So it's a little bit concerning. There is buried infrastructure at Rocky Flats that's got detectable levels of radionuclides attached to them. At certain points during the project, we actually stopped trying to remove those structures when removal was more dangerous than leaving it in place. This material is fixed contamination and it's actually building structures and those are all documented in the Rocky Flats Legacy Management Agreement. There's a drawing that shows buried infrastructure. And the reason for that is so that folks in the future know where those things are. It also included things like old and new process waste lines that were buried in the ground that carried waste from the buildings to treatment facilities. The closure project was completed uh, October 13, 2005, and that was the date when I got the keys to the final gate. The detonation of the first atomic bomb during World War II really let the genie out of the bottle, and we're never going to be able to get it back. This immense power is so vital to our national security. It also creates incredible infrastructure and jobs. But there is no way to produce nuclear weapons without harming the environment and putting workers and local population at risk. It's been very difficult for the workers. It's taken years for them to get any compensation. You had to prove when and where you were exposed to something and what you were exposed to. So that's problematic because often you didn't know what you were exposed to. If you actually look at the records and all the class action lawsuits that have been filed over the years, a lot of them won't come to fruition because there's no definitive proof that X caused Y. Most of the people that actually ended up with cancer or things of this nature, I don't believe were mainly from plutonium. I honestly believe it was primarily from other things in a normal chemical plant, and that includes myself. So the Rocky Flats culture was protect people from the plutonium because that's the bad actor. And if you do that, you don't really have to worry about the other exposures. So chemical exposures were never really documented. There really wasn't a program to protect people from chemical exposures. The respirators we had had HEPA filters in them, which is a pleated paper filter. It's made to catch particles. It's not made to stop chemicals. There also was a practical side. The work had to get done. And if everybody was in there sealed up to the max, they couldn't do the work anymore. People had to get in there and use their hands and had to get close to the material to do their jobs. So compromises were made. Ultimately, the federal government recognized 22 different types of cancer caused by radiation exposure. If you worked at Rocky Flats before 1983, and if you developed one of those types of cancer, the government classed you into the Special Exposure Cohort, or SEC class. Workers classed as SEC didn't have to prove that exposure to radiation caused their illnesses. But workers who started after 1983 or were exposed to other types of toxins fall outside the SEC class. They not only have to prove they were exposed to radiation using records from the site, but also that their illness was caused by that exposure. It's up through 1983 from 53 to 83, and now we're working on getting it from 83 till the end of the plant site because a lot of people have been exposed during the D&D. My cancer is one of the second most common cancers at the flats. I had a renal cancer. My cancer is one of the 22 listed cancers. So in order to get my SEC class, it has to be expanded to 1989. I got $150,000 from the Department of Energy or Department of Labor. They looked at all the employees and are still looking at all the employees and there's still a lot of people working towards giving more of the people compensation. For many workers who fall outside the SEC class, finding records of their exposure and proving those exposures caused their disease is a nearly impossible task. 
It's very easy to give up. You fill out the paperwork, and then they ask you for proof that you got sick out there. But our records are in the federal center somewhere, and we have almost no access to them. They say, well, get your doctor to write you a letter to say that your condition is very unusual and you can attribute it to your work at Rocky Flats plant. Well, the doctor probably never heard of Rocky Flats plant. So it's very hard to get a doctor to make a commitment like that. We're just such a small group of people. We're just a ghost right now. Here's the ironic thing about both Rocky Flats and the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. These two patches of extremely contaminated land are now both wildlife refuges. It's one of the ironies of the Cold War that we're left with this toxic legacy. It also helps us appreciate nature. If you look at the boundary that's black and yellow, and it's configured like what the plant looked like when there were buildings, that's the central operating unit one. That's the contaminated area. And around that is the, the refuge itself. The Department of Energy is responsible for the maintenance and surveillance of the property. I don't see the central operable unit uh, being transferred outside of DOE jurisdiction for the foreseeable future, mainly because of the types of contaminants out there. They're long lived in the environment, so is there a risk to people off site? I don't personally think so. We are not an operating facility, so any perceived or real risk from the Rocky Flat site is orders of magnitude below what it could have been during an operation. It's been allowed to revert back to its natural state typical grassland development. We have a resident elk herd that's probably now up to 30 or so. We've also had bear out there, mountain lions. It's beautiful land and we poisoned it. I wouldn't want a house anywhere near that plant and to see them encroaching on that property is just frightening to me. Do we have the truth about Rocky Flats? And my answer is absolutely not because the grand jury material that was acquired during the investigation and the evidence in the FBI and the EPA cases haven't seen the light of day. I am hopeful that the workers that were involved in the production of nuclear weapons, they are deserving of compensation. What I did was help this country the best way I could. I spent my time as what is now called a Cold War warrior. I never served in the military. It was kind of my opportunity to do something for my country. Rocky Flats was never given any credit for scientific advancements in all kinds of technology. There was at least 500 people out there always working for advancement, and my grandkids and my great grandkids will benefit from a lot of these advances. Rocky Flats has left this uh, community with a very heavy legacy. It's divided our community in so many ways for a very long time.